today to have uh, my little grandkids and Amy and Justin here with us and my niece Jennifer my favorite niece and uh, my brother's oldest uh, like Amy's my oldest and so they're they're buds and uh, just glad for all of you being here as well and a shift to uh, my preaching microphone because I got to use my hands so I'm just glad you're all here. You know, every time we come together, it's my prayer that we grow. You know, I've been preaching on leadership on Wednesday nights because I believe the body of Christ needs to rise up and be seen and be heard. You know, what you have, what you carry of the power of the living God is something that can make a difference. I mean, in, 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 even before you say anything, just the presence of God. It's not only in your heart, but there's kind of like a force shield around you. And as you get close to people, you know, they can, they can feel the presence of God. I want you to believe that. Amen. That everywhere you go, when you walk out of this sanctuary, you that believe here today, you are on a mission. Uh, you're on the mission field. You're on assignment by God. And you're a carrier of the power of God. So watch out world, because Jesus not only rose from the dead, you know, some 2,000 years ago, but he's alive today and operating in power through his people. Do you believe that? Yes. You know, we're singing a lot of songs where we're making those kind of declarations. And uh, one of uh, the regular resurrection songs that we sing throughout the whole year is Jesus Messiah. Name above all name, the, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus, Messiah. And then uh, one part of that song, it says, the whole world trembled and the veil was torn. The veil was rent, the Bible says. What does that mean? It's very important for today, for Easter Sunday, for Resurrection Day, because sometimes we look at a veil as being something you know, dainty like, like this beautiful white cloth hanging from the cross. But this is speaking about the veil in the temple that was like the doorway to the Holy of Holies. And it was designed to keep people out from getting into the presence of God. And only the high priest could go there once a year and he would take the blood of a sacrifice to atone for the sins of the Israelites and sprinkle it on the mercy seat, on the the lid of the Ark of the Covenant that has the cherubims, you know, uh, leaning over. They believed the presence of God was housed there, was sitting there. Well, on the cross, the Bible tells us the last words of Jesus before he gave up his spirit and he died, as it were, it was just three words. It is finished. Now, to just the natural ear, somebody could say he's, he's just about to die. So he's saying, my life is finished. That's not what he meant. He meant the plan of God to rescue humanity is finished. I gave my life as the sacrifice, the blood of Jesus, a sinless sacrifice was given. It was finished, but not quite. He had to go in the grave and be resurrected. I say this, if he'd have just died on the cross, you know, he'd have joined a lot of other noble martyrs in the world today. But Jesus proved that he was God when he went into the grave. He fulfilled prophetic scriptures, messianic prophecies that said he would be buried for three days and rise again. Jesus proved his divinity. If he hadn't rose from that grave, we wouldn't have Pentecost today. We wouldn't have had the day of Pentecost. We wouldn't have the, the miracles that we walk in today had he not rose from the grave. So I want to just celebrate that the veil is rent. What that means is the Bible tells us that that dividing curtain that kept people out of the Holy of Holies, kept people away from the presence of God, when Jesus said it was finished, it was rent, the Bible says, from the top to the bottom, like the mighty hand of God said, that's it. I'm opening the way, making it possible for people to know me. Yes. Friends, today, let me tell you, the story of the resurrection of Christ 
is not just a history, history lesson. It's a wonderful story, but it doesn't end there. The power of God is at work on planet Earth today through people that just simply say yes to Him. And I want to celebrate that today through the Word of God. If you'll give me my screens and you want to turn in your Bible, I want to give the account of this resurrection out of John's Gospel. It's, on, it's in all four Gospels. But I want to help you understand first, if I can, that today we're celebrating the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. We could probably start by understanding Passover because we get that word out of Exodus 12, 13. It commemorates the miracle of God delivering the Israelites out of the slavery in Egypt. And you remember the story, God was about to visit Egypt with a, a final plague that was going to turn the heart of Pharaoh. This is almost 4,000 years ago. But he told the children of Israel to put blood, the blood of a lamb, on the doorpost of their homes. And then he said the death angel would pass over them. Here's how it reads in Exodus 12, 13. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Guess what? When you say yes to Jesus, and you can do that today in the house of the Lord, you get the blood of Jesus. I mean, this is not physical blood, but spiritually speaking, Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross and His resurrection power today allows you to have full redemption, full forgiveness of your sins, full freedom from, from uh, guilt of your sin through the blood of Jesus that was shed. You literally are putting it on the doorpost of your house. This is the house that God lives in today, in this vessel. And you make it impossible for sickness and evil to continue to live in this house because it's unauthorized in the temple of the Lord. Can you say unauthorized? You know, sometimes we're praying, we're praying to God, but what you want, want to do is you want to speak to your sickness or speak to your fears about the God that you serve. And when you tell them that because of the work that Christ did on the cross, that that sickness is unauthorized in the temple of the living God. Amen, somebody? So we know that today when we see the image of a lamb at Easter, it comes from this scripture, John the Baptist, after three years of Jesus, 30 years of Jesus growing up in his father's home, he's headed towards the water to be baptized. John the Baptist sees him coming and he says, Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist recognized Jesus for who he was. Somebody told me in the sunrise service today, Easter is not about the bunny, it's about the lamb. Okay? <laughs> I thought that was good. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through Adam, one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. So the resurrection has the opportunity to neutralize the curse of sin in this earth and in your life. I believe that. Jesus won the battle over sin and death. So you become legally acquitted of your sin and guilt. And the Bible says, reckoned righteous as though you'd never sin. So I want to just remind you of that today as we see all these beautiful images of spring and Easter. Hallelujah. Let's remember the true meaning of this holy day. Here it is. Say it with me. He is risen. He is risen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody asked me sometime, why are you celebrating Easter and Christmas? 
because it's about Jesus. Do you know Christmas is Christ Mass? Christmas. Everybody knows it re it's celebrating the birth of Jesus. Let's keep it that way. If they're able to do away with Christmas, they've done more than take the Christ out of Christmas. And what about Easter? Everybody knows it's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You better get over all that stuff that you know, everybody wants to debate and argue about. Whether we use Easter or Passover or first fruits, whatever. Forget about it. It's about Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So let's keep it up there first, uh, first place when these holidays roll around. After all, some people are CEO Christians. Christmas and Easter only Christians. So we want to at least get them in church then. I'm going to turn to John 20 and just point out a couple things to you. Here's what I want to help you understand today. Everybody knows the resurrection story. But here's what I want you to think about. What was on Jesus' mind after he came up out of the grave? Here he was preaching for three years, maybe three and a half years. And then he knew that he was just going to make an appearance. What he wanted to do was just underscore a couple key things in his whole ministry time, don't you think? And so Jesus comes out of the grave. The Bible says that he appeared to over 500 people. So forget about it. Enough people saw him to confirm that he is risen. But I want you to know what was on his mind. First of all, in this passage, we, say, we see that he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, this former sinner woman from which Jesus had cast out seven demons. Now, that's a pretty bad woman right there. <laughs> but the Bible specifically says he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. I want you to know today, God cares about you. Don't think that you are so bad or that you've been had such a, a rotten past that somehow you'll never be good enough for God. No! You know what can happen? Your life can be the strongest testimony of anybody you know because if God can do it for you, He can do it for anybody. You know what I'm saying? Mary Magdalene. And the first words of Jesus, He sees Mary crying. He says, woman, why are you crying? The Bible says that Jesus Christ is a high priest, that he's touched by the feeling of our infirmities. He cares. He knows what you're going through. You say, well, then why doesn't God take it away? Well, sometimes we learn and we grow, even through the tribulations and the pains that we suffer. I know uh, um, you've met my oldest daughter, Amy, here, but I got a younger daughter, Michelle, and Michelle is this strong-willed daughter in, in our uh, children being brought up. And just to show you that is uh, she, uh, when she was three years old, I wanted to teach her how to ride a bike. We got our little bicycle, and I had vision, vision of holding it by the back seat and showing my little girl how to ride the bike, like I did with Amy. But Michelle got that bike between her legs and said, No, Daddy, I got this. Go away, Daddy. She didn't want me to help her. She didn't even want me to be around. So I went back in the house, and she stood over that bicycle, walking it down the long driveway that we have. And uh, she didn't know how to pedal it. She didn't want any help. I went in the house. I'm watching out of the window. I see her get to the end of the drive, and then her feet got tangled up in the, the pedals, and she went down. And she started crying. And then she was looking for Daddy. <laughs> Running all the way back, I waited for her to come in the door and then jump into my arms. Sometimes tears are a good way to bring you closer to God. If you've done some crying, let me tell you, God is waiting for you to simply say yes to His gift of life. And it's not just eternal life, it's life here on earth. Everybody's searching for God. And they just don't know it, you know, until they find them. Say, that's what that emptiness was in my heart that God can fill. David, the psalmist, he said this about God. He wrote so many psalms that we understand. They had a close relationship. He said to God, you keep track of all my sorrows. 
You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. Let me tell you, today I've got good news for you. The Savior of the world is not a religion. It's not a particular church or a particular denomination. It's a relationship with the creator of the world and the Savior, Jesus, who died on the cross, went into the grave, and was resurrected by the power of God and who invites you to say yes so His Spirit can live in you. Amen. Hallelujah. I love, too, that this story goes on that uh, Jesus asked her uh, why she was crying. And uh, she said, and he said, who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, Mary said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Hallelujah. You know what? God knows you by name. And he wants that kind of relationship with you. The Bible says that every hair of your head is numbered. God knows everything about you. And what I've discovered is that people in the world today that have rejected Christ or rejected salvation, they just have got religion confused with a creator God that wants relationship with his people. And I remember that at a crisis in my life, that I heard the voice of God call me by name, called me Philip. Yeah. Only my mother called me by that name. And I heard God's voice. Twice I heard it. And God began to comfort me and, and give me instruction. I heard the voice of God. It made all the difference. I remember once uh, on a young man on the street that was rejecting our prayer meeting. We had a prayer meeting going on in the chapel um, out on 14th Street. And uh, I was just calling people in from the street. And he was sitting on the curb. And I said, hey, come on in and join us. We're about to have a little prayer meeting. He said, no, I don't want anything to do with God. I said, okay. And I walked in the chapel and then walked out the back door and came around and sat down beside him and started talking to him. And uh, he turned away from me, but I kept talking to him and just telling him about how God had made a difference in my life. And all of a sudden, he turned back towards me. And when I said something, he said, did you say God spoke to you? I said, yes, he did. He started crying. He said, I wish God would speak to me. I wish God would speak to me. Let me tell you, church, if you've got somebody maybe in your family or friends that is rejecting Christ, they're rejecting religion. They're not rejecting a relationship with the Creator God. And what you want to pray is that the Holy Spirit will simply speak to them, manifest Himself to them. That's what people are looking for. And I, I want to say that today because if you're in the house here and, and you're looking for that kind of relationship and you'd like God to speak to you, He will. He will. The fact that you're here, the Bible says as you draw towards Him, He'll draw towards you. You're here. Something compelled you to come to church today. And the Bible says, if you seek him, you'll find him. That's the God that we serve. And the story goes on. Jesus, he went from here to find his disciples. And where were they? The Bible says they were hiding and scared, fearful, behind locked doors, fearful because they didn't want to be associated with Jesus. Their lives might be in danger. It says in verse 19, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, uh, God is interested in you. I got ahead of myself a little bit here. Jesus told Mary, go tell my brothers, go find my brothers. That's how interested God is in, in you. Go, in, go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and said that to the disciples. I love this scripture. It's the Great Commission scripture. Go ye into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. 
whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Jesus said those words and then ascended into heaven. If he were to wrap his whole ministry up to just one verse, the last words before he ascended and left this earth was to his disciples, that's to most of us here today, go and tell others of the good news. Hallelujah. And the Bible says real clearly, all you have to do is receive him. As many as receive him, he gives power to become the sons of God. So Jesus goes and finds the disciples himself. The Bible says he walked through the door where they were hiding in fear. And here's another statement of Jesus. What was on his mind? Peace be unto you. You know, he could have been critical of them. What are you doing? I told you that I would be going into the grave and I'd come again and you saw me and why are you hiding behind doors? You know, this is your greatest hour. But he didn't rebuke them or condemn them. You know what he did? He just spoke peace to them and he recommissioned them. You know, a lot of people today, they've accepted Christ maybe at a young age and then they got away from God. And uh, maybe the circumstances of life just got too great and you ran from God. Let me tell you, he hasn't left you. All you have to do is turn around. He's still there and say, yes. I remember when Jesus was in the boat with the disciples in a storm and they were afraid of it sinking. And Jesus, what, would he, what was he doing sleeping in the bottom of the boat at total peace? Well, maybe you've got Jesus in there, but he's sleeping. I'm telling you, wake him up. Wake him up and just say, Jesus, I receive you. Come back into my life and make that difference in my life. Jesus said these words in another place in John, John 14, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world giveth. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. David the psalmist, he said, you have made known to me the path of life. In your presence there's fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I'm talking to you today about a Savior that comes into your life and brings peace, comes into your life and brings joy. Isn't that what we're looking for? Let me tell you, the only way you can find it in a world so full of strife, the Bible says in Philippians, a peace that passes all understanding. You can't understand why you're at peace in the midst of such a troubled world around you. That's what God does. Hallelujah. I've told the story of how the peace in me one time just totally restored a, a, a woman that had been diagnosed with multiple personality uh, disorder. That's what the doctors had, had uh, diagnosed it. For 13 years, this woman could not have a normal conversation with her parents. And they brought her to this outdoor meeting that I was speaking at. At the end, I was praying for people and they brought their daughter down. She was so demonized that uh, she, she was foaming at the mouth. She had, during this outdoor service, she had been cutting herself uh, like some people do. You know, the enemy, he comes to kill, steal and destroy. And that enemy in her, that spirit in her had, had made her angry and responding uh, negatively to the things of God that were being spoken. But her parents brought her down. Here she was sitting on the ground. I sat down in front of her without anything to say. I, I was asking God, what, what do I say? What do I say? I, I didn't know, you know just how to deal with this because she was foaming at the mouth, angry in her eyes and just cursing and swearing and, at everybody that would come towards her. I sat down in front of her with just the peace of God, because I'm telling you, it wasn't me. It was the Christ in me. And I just started saying, the peace of God be upon you, the peace of God. And I watched her relax. I watched the spirits leave her. Her parents said they hadn't been able to even talk to her, the right person in there. She had like six different personalities. 
They hadn't been able to talk to her for 13 years. We went out to dinner that night. They said the first time they were able to take their daughter to a restaurant in 13 years, God miraculously healed her with his peace. Just with peace. You know, you don't have to have hands laid on you. You just need to be filled with the power of the living Christ, the risen Christ. That's what I'm saying here today. In the early service, I was talking about, uh, uh, I, I told earlier, I told you about the, the fellow that's blind eye was open in the worship service. You don't even have to come to an altar in a church. Christ just wants you to say yes, yes to him. Hallelujah. I want to show you the next words that Jesus said to the disciples. He said, I'm sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. That's what's on God's mind. He's not just here to, to heal you, to save you, to deliver you, but he's got an assignment for each of our lives. Aren't you glad? You know that you've got purpose here on this earth when you receive Christ into your life. And uh, I tell you what, the Holy Spirit in you gives you power. Jesus said these words before he ascended into heaven too. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in the earth today. You know what? That spirit of power is so needed to come against the evil spirit of this world. You know, this week we had another mass shooting up in New York City in that, that subway shooting. And um, I said earlier today that, you know, doctors and psychologists are trying to determine now why this man did what he did, that horrendous shooting, why he did that. I can tell you why. You know, we see it in the Word. There's an evil spirit that directed him to take lives and to do the shooting. Hatred and evil. The enemy, the spirit of this world is still alive and well here in the world today. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, let me tell you, he makes a difference. That's what I'm talking about today, church. Not religion. Religion, the Bible says, divides. Denominations, you know. I'm not saying there's everything wrong with denominations when the gospel is being preached in a church, no matter what the label is on that church. Praise God. But what I'm saying to people who have largely dismissed the institutional church is don't worry about it. Just search and find the living Christ. Receive him into your life and watch the difference he can make. Amen, somebody? The sixth thing that Jesus said here upon his resurrection was stop doubting and believe. He said that to doubting Thomas. I got to tell you, I was kind of a doubting Thomas growing up and I had seen so much. You know, I, I uh, grew up with a preaching father and mother. Uh, most of you know that. And I had been to many, many church services. I'd been to the altar many times. But you know what made the difference for me was when God came and revealed himself personally to me. That was through the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But I remember so many times where I just needed something to, to show me that you know, I need to see it with my own eyes, hear it with my own ears. Like Thomas, he said, I won't believe until I touch the scars in his hands, until I see the wound in his side, because I saw him die on the cross. He was one of the disciples. And Jesus was so good. He came a week later just to find doubting Thomas. And he said, here, Thomas, touch him, touch him. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. Hallelujah. And I, I, I preach in this church. Friends, I preach every week with a hunger, a desire to increase your faith so that we just stop doubting and believe. I grieve with the many years that I wasted because I was just waiting for God to, to, to show himself real in my life. Even though my parents raised me right and I came to church, um, I mean, I'm going to credit them for bringing me to church. I told the early service, um, 
dear old lady came to me after service one day and said, Sonny boy, you know, uh, you know, uh, she said, I just see God doing so many things in your life. You know, just uh, how did you grow up to be such a strong man of God? I said, well, ma'am, I said, it's like this. When I was growing up, I had a drug problem. My parents drugged me to church. <laughs> and sooner or later, you know, I mean, I heard the gospel being preached. I heard faith being preached. And one day it was on this carpet right down here where I sit, where God plastered me down there, gave me a vision of Jesus and baptized me in the Holy Spirit. Here's what I'm saying to you. If it hasn't worked for you yet, just keep coming to church. Keep coming into his presence. And sooner or later, you're going to hear the voice of God. Sooner or later, you're going to see something of reality in your life. Don't quit searching. The fact that you're here, the Bible says you draw closer to God and he'll draw closer to you. You keep seeking him and you'll find him. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hallelujah. Well, Thomas, he believed too. He said, my Lord, my God. Jesus said these words, if you can but believe, then all things are possible. Hallelujah. This portion of scripture goes on where Jesus saying, listen, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. I want to leave you with that today. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asks the question, do you believe this? Every one of us has to answer that question. I can't answer it for you, but I've got good news for you. All you've got to say is yes. Yes. You don't even have to come to an altar or raise your hand. Say yes. Make it a personal decision with Christ. I had a fellow once that I was ministering to at the fairgrounds, and he said, Pastor Phil, he said, I, I believe uh, that you're doing such a great work out there. I, I believe that the Bible's a, a great book to live by, but I just, can't, I, I just can't believe. I thought, wow, you're so close. All you got to do is say yes, because it's more than just a good way to live. It's about salvation and about being sealed for eternity. Do you believe this? You can simply say yes. The Bible says if you'll believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. I want to give everybody an opportunity in the house here today to make a decision for Christ. And if you're watching online, you can make a decision for Christ. And you can even raise your hand online and give us some follow-up information on you. It's that simple. But I want everybody in here that heard this message to know that God knows you by name. He loves you enough to be pursuing you. He's not going to let you go. If you're here today, you've got hunger enough to be reaching out to God. Even if you're only coming to church on Easter, I've got you here. I want to give you the opportunity to simply say yes and receive them in your heart. Let's all put our hands on our heart right now. It's the center of your being. It's that part of your being that makes decisions. As you're making a decision today, Father, I pray that you'll look into the lives and hearts of everyone here. And Lord, if there's anyone that's just even not sure, not even just not, they're here because they, they want to believe, but they're just not sure whether they're right with you. Father, today, today, as we corporately together say yes, I pray, Father, reveal yourself and your power, Lord, to somebody here, maybe for the first time, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's pray this together. Say, Lord Jesus, I say yes. I believe that you died on the cross. You rose from the grave. And you invite me to receive your great salvation. Today, Lord, I receive you. Come into my heart. Fill me with your spirit. And empower me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah. Somebody said, is, is, is it that easy? Can it just happen that quickly? Well, that's where it starts.